So welcome back to the room and uh, let me introduce you to our first remote presenter, uh, Hong Kiang Fan. We'll, uh, you can start. Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Hong Kiang Fan and uh, um, this is my first time to attend this uh, Linux Summit. Um, very, um, you can see my, I'm very exciting. And uh, it's uh, also a little bit surprised that uh, um, I can be selected um, on the agenda. Um, I'm fairly new to Linux. Um, so if I make some um, mistakes or errors, that's obviously to you guys, please uh, um, uh, be nice to me. Um, um, and uh, uh, I'm working on some CXL related stuff. Um, CXL is also a new concept and uh, many of you guys might no, uh, one of the potential usage for CXL is about uh, memory expansion. Um, so uh, we have some uh, like a, this is still in the concept level because uh, we don't have any real CX, CXL device yet to work on, um, but just some uh, thinking about uh, um, how we can use uh, CXL memory um, together with uh, the container softwares. Uh, so uh, let's get started. Uh, so first thing, why we talk about a uh, uh, container and uh, uh, software memory um, interface, because uh, currently there are um, kind of device driver uh, for the containers, which is called storage interface. Uh, it's a middle layer between the containers and the many um, storage system like the cloud, NAS, fabric, persistent memory. Um, so the whole system can work together better. Uh, for memory, uh, we are thinking about a similar idea, uh, but due to the fact that memory is so different to a uh, storage system, um, so we are thinking about what could be the changes and how to make it happen uh, in an easier way. Uh, so uh, like uh, um, shown in the presentation, uh, the container storage interface only opens to file storage. Uh, but if we want to, um, uh, make this container to better utilize memory, probably we need some APIs uh, between the system and uh, the container software. So something maybe people will call it memory interface. Uh, there are some possibilities like uh, currently persistent memory can be uh, used uh, as a uh, 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 direct access device and the CXL device probably can be treated as the same way but is there any like a performance difference? Because uh, uh, an ideal CXL uh, memory device can be used as system memory. There's a very little change um, I require for system to use it. Um, and uh, what's the benefit uh, could a, a memory interface can give us? Uh, one thing I think is uh, it will provide us some uh, opportunity for tiering system, uh, even though how how to implement it and where is the best location for the tiering system is uh, another um, question that people may have a lot of discussions. Um, uh, and the, the other why is uh, the container could be used as, uh, I mean, the, the, the memory interface could be uh, actually a fabric management layer that control the resources uh, on a large uh, scalable memory system. So, uh, uh, so just here are uh, some uh, very basic scenarios, I think, uh, where the memory interface could happen. Uh, the first uh, scenario is a very basic. It's basically um, nothing needs to be changed. Um, the container uses whatever the system is providing to it. Um, and uh, on the second uh, uh, scenario, there's a little bit more um, so we say the container itself wants to implement a, a tiering engine and the tiering engine needs to know uh, which piece of uh, um, the physical memory space are from the DRAM and which um, space are from the CXL. And if there are different NUMA nodes, is NUMA node the correct way to use it or, or direct access to the physical space is the better way. Um, and the third one is uh, uh, the container itself doesn't care about tiering. But let's do the work with the, inter um, the uh, memory interface itself. 
Um, and uh, uh, the last scenario is uh, just trying to expand the scalability. Uh, different servers could connect it to the same uh, memory appliances and uh, each of the server can like request um, the memory based on its need. Um, so that's uh, um, pretty much what I think about the usage for, uh, for the container um, memory interface. Um, it's, uh, as I mentioned, this is a very early stage of the work and uh, there is no real hardware for us to do some experiments yet. Uh, but uh, um, yeah, it's things are early. Uh, so what uh, we would like to um, know or we would like to discuss is, uh, um, is there possible to have a common standard? Not uh, like each company is making their own standard for the interface. And uh, if so, what kind of uh, um, parameters, APIs, or data structures um, that the kernel needs to provide to the software? Um, and the other one is uh, what myself felt, felt very interesting is, uh, could we host the container on a CXL owning, uh, like a CXL owning uh, container? And uh, uh, where to put the, um, memory tier engine, is it better to be inside the container or is it better to be on the interface or just uh, install it or implement it in the Linux kernel, let the kernel to handle everything. Um, and the, the other one is about uh, uh, the fabric management. Um, if there's uh, like many servers connected to the memory appliance, what could, like what would people like to do? And also, as I mentioned many times, uh, uh, it will heavily involved with the design of tiered memory engine. Um, so um, I think the rest of the time will be open to discussions. Um, myself is not uh, uh, yet very experienced. Uh, I'm still learning and get, trying to get more involved with the memory uh, management side. Um, so uh, well, I would like to listen to the experts here um, in the meeting room and uh, uh, other folks online. Um, any? Um, so, uh, oh, so I had a question. When I think of the containers, is, is this a C group problem? Could we, we manage this at the C group level, right? And, and, and just carve out NUMA nodes, like per NUMA node allocations? And like, why do you need the CMI interface, right? Uh, that's just my thought. Yes, yes, uh, that's also a good question. Uh, um, I think it's the C group is probably the best or simplest place to start with. Uh, C group now can like assess the maximum of uh, memory, but I don't know if there's a, a way or is, is it easy to implement saying, I want to give uh, so much memory from this new node and uh, so much from another one. Um, I, I don't think we have any interface like that, but what we have is CPU sets uh, uh, that can bind you to a particular set of NUMA nodes, which can help. And But uh, I don't think we have any quality of service for, uh, let's say, uh, defining how you want to spread your memory on those specific NUMA nodes. So is that something that would be really necessary or uh, or you can work with uh, just defining the NUMA list of, uh, of, or a list of NUMA nodes that you want to operate on and use memory C group for, let's say, limiting the com total amount of memory. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I can see that uh, um, like use C group can control the total amount of memory it's feasible at this point. Um, Problem is uh, now nobody knows, or well, at least there's no real hardware for this, or no real application scenarios. All those are kind of in imagination. Um, so what's the problem is, uh, or at least uh, I would like to just propose one uh, use case, like saying one hypervisor is running maybe 10 different containers. I want to keep them uh, kind of uh, their memory performance similar. So I want to give them exactly the same uh, size of the DRAM and the CXL memory. So if 
that's the case. Um, and the C group is able to like same limit uh, the memory size by different numa, numa node. That would be a way to accomplish this. But if that's really necessary or, or how much uh, uh, real usage, I don't know, I can answer that. There are people who want a capability like this because in systems where persistent memory is used kind of in a volatile mode, which we can do in, in mainline today, um, they want to be able to set up things and say, hey, we have a container that somebody, you know, paid the cheap price for. So we're going to give them a lot of slower tier memory. And we have another one that somebody paid top dollar for it. So we're going to give them lots of regular RAM. So people definitely want to do this. And it, it uh, matters even before CXL is in the picture. So systems that are doing this with, you know, Intel Optane today uh, would, would like to do something like this. And I did post a URL in the chat, uh, just some patches that kind of start down this direction. So there's, uh, there are people who have the same problem today. So, so is there any way to solve this with NUMA control now? No, uh, not, not easily. So with NUMA control, what you can do is say, like you can lock somebody away and say, um, you know, the allowed nodes, you're not allowed to access on a DRAM node. And that would put you all on, you know, a slower tier. Or you can say you're only allowed access to the DRAM node, then you're kind of in a fast tier. But it's kind of all or nothing on a node basis. And <clears throat> there are problems there, like if you lock somebody, sometimes people have the persistent memory node, for instance, all as zone movable. And if you set, um, if you set uh, only to be able to access on a, on a, on a new movable only node, um, strange stuff happens. So there are some uh, not, not great side effects from what's happening now. Um, so no, Newman control isn't good enough today. People really do want to be able to mix and match these things a little bit. And like it was mentioned, like this is kind of a quality of service thing. It's kind of like right now it's all or nothing. And people want to kind of have that be a little more of a dial where you can select in the middle there. So, so within a Numa node, we need a way to identify the memory and then a way to, to attach to it. Well, remember that this is one of the prerequisites of all of this is that the memory that you want to manage is like every different class of memory, every different you know set of memory with a location and a set of performance characteristics is already in its own NUMA node. So we're not talking about subdividing existing NUMA nodes. Everything is already in its own node and the firmware kind of pulled us how to place it like this. So um, this is starting off with a system that already has all of its memory, you know, tiers divided into different nodes. So I know that all the current work is really focused on like DRAM and something slower than DRAM, but like one of the challenges CXL is going to pose is um, all of the above. It's going to be it's going to be a, a spectrum of vendors and a spectrum of performance targets and configurations that um, that yeah that you're going to have four or five different. I mean, in, in a pathological case, you're going to have more than just two performance classes, um, and I don't know. If we need to start thinking about that kind of stuff now, or or at least like it seems like we need to just get good at the two the two tiers first before we start worrying about the five tiers. But um, I, I noticed that the patch, the patches you posted are those are the managing between the top and the top and everything else. So I think there may be a difference between the kind of system that a hobbyist might assemble and something that uh, 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 an enterprise cloud vendor would put together. I don't know that an enterprise cloud vendor is going to put together a system that has so many different, uh, one could, but I don't think you're gonna. Yeah, I think yeah. the same uh, is not Well, I would just second that. Like, I, I think we should start with these use cases that are well defined, right? Like by everyone kind of say like, this is my vision of what it looks like be between the cl cloud sort of people and the hardware people, right? And we all kind of come come to say like, this two tiers where we start, right? And here's here's kind of where we're at. And instead of my worry with all this is it gets out of control really fast, right? And so uh, I would go for the slow approach with like tangible use cases. Yeah, the, the only thing I'd say is I think there's actually a, a, a very sane three-layer case. There's the CXL memory, there's regular DRAM, and then there's HBM. 
I, I think that's a system that makes a lot of sense to put together. I haven't heard of one that makes sense to put four together. Maybe it exists, but I want someone to tell me what it is. Well, I think CXL also isn't a monolithic thing either. Um, you know, you could have DRAM attached via CXL, which is going to be slower than something directly attached to the CPU. And then you could have, for instance, you know, Optane attached via CXL. And so you could have multiple CXL attached tiers. And since CXL is going to be, since it is an open standard and anybody can build a CXL card, I would very much expect there to be a lot of weird CXL devices out there. And there'll be a pretty uh, you know, diverse group of devices. So rather than there being like, hey, CXL devices are going to be one tier, I, I think there's going to be a bunch of different kinds of CXL devices. One... And actually, and people have even talked about, um, you know, what if a system didn't have any direct attached DRAM? CXL might be the only way that you attach normal RAM to a system as well. And, and one proposal I saw recently in the list was just to, to default all memory to, to top tier and just let the, the driver decide, no, this should be slower tier. Yeah, and that yeah. actually seemed like a pretty sane way to do it up front to me. So you got to start somewhere. Yeah, so actually that's another uh, kind of question or idea that I really want to propose is you, the Linux need to know um, the performance of the device. Like uh, whoever builds up the system should have some idea about how this um, CXL device performance uh, relative to the DRAM and the other CXL device that he's going to plug into the system. So is that uh, he should provide some configurations then let uh, Linux handle the rest or Linux is able to like auto balance the performance just based on how it real works. Well, so there is uh, quite a bit of standards work in this area. Um, you know, ACPI has a long-standing way of enumerating um, the latency between different NUMA nodes, and so that's there. You know, that's been there for a long, long time. There's uh, also some newer things happening in ACPI around this, and I know not everything is ACPI, but just I'll talk about the ACPI world here for a sec. Yeah. Um, there's something called the HMAT, the Heterogeneous Memory Something Table. Um, and that actually will give you uh, individual uh, read and write latency and bandwidth for every individual proximity domain in ACPI, which is roughly a NUMA node in, in, in Linux. So we have that in the standards world today. And then for CXL, there's also the CDAT table. Um, and I have no idea what that even stands for, but CDAT. And that provides um, basically the same information as the HMAT does, but for CXL attached memory. Um, and I, I think I Dan's in the room there if I missed anything there. But yes. there is a coherent? Yeah, coherent device attribute table. Okay. Yeah. But so I just wanted to point out that everybody's using the term CXL device. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, but you really need to make sure you're thinking about the fact that these things participate in interleave sets. And it's not, it, 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 the way that CXL redefines sort of your memory regions are no longer just here's a device. And so you have to be really careful when you start talking about NUMA nodes and, and, and mapping them to a device because I think you're moving into an area where that no longer applies. So um, yeah, just for those in the room who maybe weren't familiar with that, it's an important aspect of the spec. I was also gonna say that like Linux today, we're still very, um, married to the idea that uh, NUMA nodes have distances and that's how we organize them and prioritize them. We do, yeah, so Dave mentioned we have the HMAT, other firmwares might have something similar, but we just we just publish that information. It's not really plumbed in any kind of sane way into the kernel memory policies, policy decisions yet. Um, but yeah, I think that I think that's coming because the, the CDAT is something that is a per vendor published table that tells you nominal bandwidth uh, read write read write bandwidth read write latency, and then the kernel has to when the the driver uh, unless the BIOS mapped it, the, the driver has to go parse that, figure out how many devices are there, the switch routing to it, and, and then and then tells the kernel, hey, this is this NUMA node has about this performance, but right now today we have to boil that down to a distance a distance number, which which is I think I think it's okay for I think I think it's okay to start, um, but. But yeah. It's a very small baby step. Yeah, yeah, I agree too, right? 
just because you, when we see Excel it opens up, I think, new classes of media, right? And, and so there could be rewrite of symmetries. And me personally, like looking at PMEM before, right? Like I, I think it was very, uh, it, it, the NUMA distance didn't work, right? Because there was a rewrite of symmetry, right? And we, we need to advertise that up to applications so that they, they know and they can act on this information. Yeah, so like Dan said, it is actually in a place right now where applications can read it. It's dumped out in the NUMA um, directories and stuff. So people can't actually figure this out if, if an app knows where to look. But I think the, the harder question there is how the kernel makes decisions around here. Because, you know, right now, like all of our fallbacks for NUMA node allocations are based on, you know, that, that one distance number that Dan was talking about. And so um, not that we'd want to do this, but today, like let's say that somebody had a really write heavy workload versus somebody that had another workload that was really, you know, read heavy. They might have different preferences about which new nodes they want to fall back to because they want to stay away from, you know, that guy that's doing a lot of writes wants to stay away from the media that has, um, you know, really slow write performance. So um, right now, you know, they have to go figure out in user space what they're going to do and kind of map that onto a new policy um, themselves. There's no way for the kernel to, um, there's no, Currently, no implementation in the kernel that that uh, you know uses any of the information to do anything smart to say, oh, this application is doing a lot of writes. Maybe I don't want to put their allocations there. I'm not saying we should do that, but I'm just saying um, you know there's there's a lot of opportunity there. There's a lot of data that that we're not using or consuming in the kernel at all to do anything smart with it. Maybe we don't want to, but there there at least are a lot of options for us. We're leaving a lot on the table today. So I want to get back to the presenter about this question about placing a tiered memory engine. And certainly the kernel is working on making this as automatic as possible for applications that don't want to care about NUMA, which is probably most of them. Like, I think, I think most people don't want to worry about NUMA. Um, it, it, that's, that's the kernel's problem. Um, so when I, when I see things like tiered memory engine, I'm worried about the, uh, the kernel and user space getting in fights about where the, about who's doing the tiering and, and when. Um, at, at least with this uh, device mapped interface, you take the, you basically you explicitly take the memory out of the kernel's control and do it yourself. Um, but I, I'm not sure if we want a uh, like a hinting based daemon in user space that's instructing the kernel's tiering versus it's either all kernel or all user space, and the MM's not involved. Um, yeah, but that, that seems like a, a future decision. I do wonder what folks think about that, though, because we already do have, you know, in theory, um, we could have fights between auto NUMA and NUMA policies. I think we fixed that today by just saying, you know, Auto NUMA, essentially the kernel enforcing some kind of NUMA ordering or NUMA migration, um, completely stays away if it sees any user space policies set. Um, so I don't know whether we need something similar like that here or whether once we've started to, um, you know, do some smarter things in the kernel, whether we need the kernel to, um, to stay involved. Because maybe, you know, for Auto NUMA, it really is, um, uh, you know, it, it isn't super duper widely used. And I wonder if we get to the point where these configurations become really, really common and the kernel is doing these migrations in a, uh, you know, um, on a more frequent basis, like across the, the ecosystem, whether we'll need something a little more, I don't know, um, a little smarter than what the autonomous thing is, which is just turn, turn myself off when I see user space express, expressing any kind of intent. So I want to ask our presenter, Hong Zhang, if the, uh, do you see deficiencies in the current NUMA APIs for ex expressing what you need to express, or where, where are you seeing some of the, uh, the gear matching problems? Uh, so, so with the, um, yes, it's really, uh, what, what I really like to uh, get achieved is uh, like a way to um, just as a, 
to set a limit of memory based on either the Newman node or um, based on the range of, uh, well, it sounds like a little bit scary, like a directly tell the application state. You have uh, uh, a memory, physical memory that you can use from this here to there. It seems a little bit uh, over. So asking, um, like after considering that probably just uh, like, um, set a new knob in the NUMA control or C group is a, a better way to, to achieve what I would like to get. Yeah, and, One uh, thing yeah. uh, I would just want to let you know in terms of not having hardware. So I'm in a position to have hardware, which which is nice, but I know not a lot of people will initially. And so what my kind of shameless plug is to try to push QMU forward as well. I'd like to like bring that up in here. That way people can experiment with this too, right? And start working on these interfaces. And so my, my suggestion is to take a look at those patches, review them, you know, start working, and then you can kind of move the kernel forward with, with QMU, just to put that out there. Mm -hmm. the, the problem with that is that um, it, it's limited in, on the testing. Like, you can you can create the the different topologies of interest you want and kind of like experiment with that. But like when you want real real numbers, you're gonna come come out lacking. My, my, my idea for doing that is not about the performance numbers right now, right? If we want to talk about interfaces, and like this seems to be an interface problem, why is that not good enough now to start, right? And to like really experiment and say why the interface is not good enough yet? You can, right now without the, I mean, I'm all for the, the CXL support in, in QMU. Um, I'm just saying that um, it's also, even to test interfaces, I don't see it that necessary because um, the, the, m most of the, the examples I've been seeing are, are just fabricated with different NUMA topologies just with QMU right now. Um, I, I guess that's the fun part of QMU, right? Like fabricating all these the yeah. different topologies and then seeing like from the kernel side, can I control the control, control these? But this is the way I see it. But, but I think what, what Dave's saying is like at, at the end of the day, all that driver work ends up as just a NUMA node number. And so if we're testing the interfaces for better NUMA numbers, we can do that without emulating okay. all the CXL. But, but it, it does and get interesting when we're trying to do the algorithms of like translating CDAP, but yeah. And there is some more fine-grained stuff that we have to go do at some point, which is to say, like, uh, when is it worth moving one of these things? And how much does it actually cost to move a page around and do all the TLB shoot down and all that stuff? Um, so there are ways to do some of that today. Um, you can get a persistent memory machine. You can kind of treat that like another tier because it will act differently than DRAM. The other thing that we've done in testing is to take a, you know, a two NUMA node system, a system with actually two sockets and essentially treat that second node as far away memory and, and run it as a single socket system. So there, again, that doesn't, that's not a, that's not a CXL system, of course, but it kind of looks like one if you, if you, if you squint at it funny. So, um, there are there are ways to play with things that kind of resemble the future systems on 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 today's. So you can do it without QM, as what I'm saying. That's of course a heck of a lot more work. But if you're actually worried about performance and how some of these things will look on a real system, that's as close as you can get today. But you can go buy one. Yeah, sounds really good. Okay, Hong Jen, you, you, can, you can go ahead and, and, and wrap up uh, with the summary. Yeah. Um, yeah, so um, that's that's the last page of my uh, slide. So um, yeah, this is very good information. Of, um, and um, just hopefully um, yeah, there will be a lot of more usage for the CXL and uh, um, people, I, I think um, that there are two more sessions talking about the tiering engine. Uh, we'll get more involved in the CXL and uh, um, a lot of new um, kind of application cases. Okay, yeah, I think that's that's done for me today. Okay, thank you. Yeah, welcome, welcome to the MM community. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you.